I was once coaching a team and this one gentleman, he was Irish and he said, oh, well, in my culture, I'm just candid and we're always candid and I feel per perfectly comfortable being candid. I'm like, well, great, we're gonna get along well. And then I watched him in the meeting and I said, sir, I, you know, I appreciate what you said, but what you're really being is a lazy asshole. You're not, I mean, you, what you're doing is you're just throwing candor out on the table like a turd and you don't give a damn whether anybody hears it or does anything with it. It's indulgent. You're just throwing out truth bombs recklessly. If you want to be a member of this team, you have to own how your feedback lands and you've got to give, you've got to work your ass off to give it the highest likelihood of it getting executed. Today, I get to bring you back around the fireside to have a really fascinating chat. And our guest today, Keith Frazzi, is a fascinating, fascinating human being, uh, New York Times bestselling author, and just generally extraordinary person. And what I really like about this is that you guys all know how much I appreciate when somebody can communicate effectively from stage. And Keith is definitely one of the people who can do that really well. But I will tell you that at a few of the events where we've both been speaking at, like Keith, I think it was in Bali at one point, we got to have a very serious, very fascinating conversation on a table. And as always, when those types of conversations happen, I think to myself, if only we'd recorded this, if only mm. we'd recorded it and been able to share it with people. And so that's really what this show is all about. And it's just a chance for us to have a, one of those conversations. Uh, Keith, please uh, welcome to the show. So glad you're here. Thank you for making it and, and being patient through our technical stuff. No, thanks a lot, Eric. And I agree. I mean, I was thinking about that this morning. How many, I'm such a blessed man to have had such extraordinary dialogues and, and, and sitting around such insightful people. I almost wish that there was a webcam on my head, <laughs> you know, just those, that, that odd uh, dinner with you or whoever it is. It's just, so this will be great. I'm really looking forward to this format. Yeah, good deal. It's kind of fun. I, uh, I, my, my team was pushing me for a long time to do some kind of interviews or podcasts. And, you know, like you, I'm on planes all the time. I could never, but then when COVID came along, it's like, I have a studio, I've got time. And, and in direct violation of your book, Never Eat Alone, I'm alone. So yeah, me too. You know. <laughs> me too. I've been actually quite good as I, as I was saying a little bit during prep time with you. You know, I have, uh, I literally have been alone for two months, but and I've, I've also, I don't think I've ever been more connected. And my network has been expanding exponentially in such beautiful ways. And I can explain some of the things that I've been able to do. I, I've enlisted a, a group of uh, 70 heads of HR of some of the largest companies in the world. And we're meeting on a weekly basis in small pods of 20 to ask the question, let's not go back to work, but let's go forward to work. Yeah. And what is that going to look like? And we've been, we've been ideating the future of the headquarters, the future of virtual selling. I mean, all of these areas. And I've just hired the managing editor of Forbes, the former managing editor of Forbes, to run an entirely new effort on my behalf, a nonprofit of Go Forward to Work. I think, I think, today, I think today we're about to finally get to where all the bullshit's been for 20 years about the future of work. It's upon us. You know, Keith, I, I really, I'm really with you on that. And, and it's interesting because we shifted so much of our business about five years ago to allow us to build an online community and allow us to have an impact. So, you know, as a consequence, when this all happened, we understood the technology and we understood the skills and it made it really easy for us to transition from being largely a live event company to being a live event online company. In fact, yeah. I would suggest there's a good chance that May will be one of our best months ever in business, which I would never have guessed when this was all blowing up in March. So I, I tend to think, I like this idea, no, let's not go back to work, let's go forward to work. And I think, I think also one of the things that fits with me with that idea is like people keep talking about the economy as if there's one. And of course, you know, there's multitude, there's your economy, there's my economy, there's New York's economy. There. And, and so w the way we look at going forward to work, the way we look at, at how our jobs are in the future, I, I think so many people have a disaster mentality about it. And I think it's like, this is one of the greatest times of opportunity we've seen in, in any of our lives. Well, at any time there's disruption, right? It, it provides a great opportunity. And the, as I've been thinking about how, by the way, I unfortunately 
have not was not ahead of the curve when all of this happens uh, when it comes to online communities. I have always been the last person into <laughs> trends. I swear to God, I, re I remember many, many years ago, uh, my book, Never Read Alone, had just come out. And there was a gentleman who was a bit of a fan of the book. Um, and I had known him through this thing called Renaissance Weekend, um, which was sort of a, a New Year's gathering. And he had created this uh, website that was intended to try to create a network online. And I said to him, I was like, you know, Reed, I really appreciate what you've created, but you cannot replace physical interaction with digital. And of course, that was Reed Hoffman from LinkedIn. <laughs> and, um, and at the point, you know, he was just starting this. And I literally, if I had been, if I had an ounce of, you know, it's just, if I had an ounce of openness and more curiosity, to be honest, what I could have done is I could have leaned in and been more curious relative, as opposed to opinionated. And I look uh, back on it and I wish I had, because frankly, look, I love LinkedIn. It's one of the most extraordinary platforms out there. Um, but I believe that had I been more curious, I could have put more humanity into it from the beginning. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we need to do in the social media world is we need to start to integrate the humanity elements into our technology, right? I mean, Zoom can either be used as a broadcast platform, but the way I've been using it is I've been using it to create uh, radical uh, intimacy in short sprints. Yeah, and you can do it, right? Anyway, I don't want to go on and on and on, but you know, the point is, I'm I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there late, but uh, I'm getting there, and I feel blessed for it, actually. Yeah. But you know, Keith, here's here's what I find interesting about that. Like, I I heard this great expression a while back that you know, if you're over 20 years old, then you're an immigrant to the internet, and if you're under 20 years old, you're a natural born internet citizen, right? Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is, is that, wait a second, it's not always the citizens that have the best advantage. Mm. As we've seen, I mean, I love that. the best people that take advantage of the American dream are immigrants. I mean, I, I'm one, I, I, you know, that it's like sometimes, excuse me, but sometimes the, the native population, the native British population, yeah. native American, and I don't mean native, but you know, the, the citizenry often takes it takes for granted the phenomenal opportunity and then an immigrant comes in and says holy i have a new way of seeing this and i've been watching you and i think that's exactly what you brought sure you were like ah you're probably like my mom digital watch no way man <laughs> <laughs> speaking of my mom one of the things i did so my mom's 89 and has asthma and um and i've been so worried about her of course in uh in pittsburgh mm. So um, one of the things I did is I, I shipped her a very large iPad, right? And um, fully loaded with everything she could possibly need, including uh, my buddy, Eric from Zoom, the CEO of Zoom. I fully loaded Zoom. I created a URL. I'm not actually gonna say what it is. It's a URL um, that is directly aimed at her that all of her, her old friends will know so that anybody, any of her, she just keeps Zoom open all the time. And any of her girlfriends that want to come in and say hi, they can't. So she's not inclined to want to go see them. Because in the past, she was like, well, why can't I go and, and you know, go across the street with so-and-so? And why can't I do this? I was like, mom, you got to stay put. You really do. And now mm. she's got this vi virtual uh, friendship that just is constantly happening from girls that she knows from where she stays in Florida, from, from down the street, et cetera. And it's just beautiful, right? And so, you know, we've got to start thinking about, and, and by the way, I got that idea years ago from the CEO of IDEO when they had acquired, um, oh gosh, the furniture company. I'm now just forgetting because I know the CEO as well. I'm just, uh, anyway, um, they created a virtual wormhole on their two desks. They just kept the video open all the times. And that's one of the things I'm encouraging to C-suites right now that they actually keep a video window open at all times because they used, to use, they used to be able to have a, a, the physical ability to just run down the hallway and grab somebody, right? Yeah. And that kind of, that kind of organic serendipitous um, interaction isn't happening as much. So therefore, how do we create it? So I'm trying to think of ways to constantly jerry-rig um, the, the systems that we have to create the kind of systems that we need in a human interaction. And that, you know, I, I think that's exactly what I mean about, in a sense, the, uh, you know, being an immigrant to the whole thing is you just look yeah. at it and go, well, I don't care what it was built for. <laughs> I, I want to know what I can use it for. So I and, it. 
Cool. And I'll tell you that my, uh, my first wife and I, we often ended up spending um, uh, quite a lot of time apart, you know, with Henry. and we, we, used to, we used to open up uh, a Skype window and we would just leave wait, it wait, wait, open. Are you going to get intimate? You're going to get too personal on here? Is I'm not going to get, it's that? not that kind of Skype window, Keith. Just Come asking. on now. Just well, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to answer those questions, but you know, that, but we just left this Skype window open. I'd be working at my desk and there's Skype over here and with the video on. And it's like every now and again, she'd get up and go, hey, can I make you a tea? It's like she's uh, 3,000 miles away, but it creates so that sweet. feeling of connection. So I really like that idea a lot. Yeah, I love that. And I can just see it. It sort of brings a little tear to my eyes, just thinking about right there next to each other. And even if just somebody's kibitzing around on the side, right? It doesn't yeah. matter. It's beautiful. Yeah, Good it you. is really Good nice. I wanted to, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, like you know you're, uh, you're you're good at your at title generation you know you're, you you really name your books well I think and, and that's really great and and I want to talk a little bit about um, leading without authority and um, I want to talk about that because I've been fascinated by leadership since I was little I, I used to go to summer camps all the time and they would always like draft me to be like an assistant counselor whenever I went there. And I never really understood that because I never felt like I showed up that way in school for some reason. But in summer camp, I was always the guy. And, and, but the weird thing is, I remember even then, I, I really liked, like, I, I liked the feeling of being in that, um, you know, that, like, in a sense, a leadership position. But I also remember part of that as a, as a young, as a 12 year old, was the significance that came yeah. with it. And of course, I was just going to say, I, I, if I throw back to that, that probably for me was the, the lack of significance that I grew up with. You know, a poor kid from Pittsburgh, my own man was an unemployed steel worker, right? And the fact that I remember that first taste of leadership and it was in fact at summer camp, it was. Yeah. Um, when, and, and that gave me that sense, of, that sense of significance. And I have to say that that, that, um, that hounded me in a negative way throughout my young career. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, the, the young man who wrote Never Eat Alone did not understand what I'm teaching in, uh, in uh, Leading Without Authority. Um, yeah. And it was quite, a, it's been quite a journey for me in my life. And it's a blessed journey, but it was difficult and rocky. And I have a lot of apologies. I've, <laughs> I've done my best <laughs> in making amends along the way, looking back from team members and things. But uh, yeah, no, I get it. And you, you want to you want to riff into that from here now? Yeah, like I, I, I here's here's a conversation, an unfortunate conversation I had one day. I was a, when I was twenty one or twenty two years old, I looked about seventeen, and I was working for this tech company, first full time employee, and they'd been trying for ages to hire people. It didn't work. They got me, and boom, I just hit it off, and I was selling like crazy, and tops it, and then we started recruiting people, and the company grew and grew and grew, and so now I'm twenty four years old, and I still look seventeen. And, uh, and so, but I'm the top sales guy in the company and the owner of the company comes up to me and he goes, I, I want you to be like the sales director of the company. And I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. He goes, yeah, but I don't want to tell anybody. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and he goes, well, you just look too young. And, and uh, you know, I, like if I, I'm out there talking to investors and if I have to walk you in as our salesman, it's just not going to, so I want you to do the job. I'll pay you to do the job, but I don't want anybody to know you're doing it. <laughs> How about the so, people inside? Leadership the without authority. No, about, he didn't he didn't want them to know. He just wanted me to do it underneath it, like well, no yeah. actual authority, but like lead it was literally lead without authority. And that's why I was so fascinated by how, how would you how approach you? that? How, how how old are you, Eric? Now? Yeah. Just 50. Oh, good for you. I want whatever facial cream you're using. Um, <laughs> I think it might be a zoom filter. I, I don't know. <laughs> um so you know, that's interesting because I think when, when that was happening to you, what was happening to me as a 20 some year old young man at Deloitte was that I had heard the CEO say uh, that he wanted someday for Deloitte to be at par with McKinsey and Accenture. At the time it was called Anderson Consulting. Yeah. And I registered that and I went back to business school I was a summer intern at Deloitte. I went back to business school and I asked a professor if I could do a white paper on the subject of professional services marketing in, instead of doing the normal class load. And I spent the entire semester speaking to the chief marketing officer of McKinsey, the chief marketing officer of Accenture. I told them all that I would turn the data back to them when I was done, so I wasn't doing anything disingenuous. Um, and I, I ended up creating this amazing description of how these great companies had built their brands. And then I shipped it to the CEO of Deloitte. 
And I said to the CEO of Deloitte, you once met me, you don't remember, at a cocktail party for interns, and I asked you a question, and here's your answer. And <clears throat> the next thing you know, um, he invited me down to New York City. And I'm sitting across the table from him uh, at dinner. And he says, Farazi, I want you to come into the company. And I said, sir, I've, I've got some other interviews. Literally the next day I had an interview with McKinsey. Um, and he said, yeah, yeah, I know about your interview with McKinsey, which I thought was creepy. And, um, and, I, and, and he said, but, but you're going to make a difference here. And we want you here and those people don't even know who you are. And I said, you know what, I I'll do it under one condition. For the remainder of the time that I'm here, I would like uh, to have two dinners a year with you, please. And he granted me those. And um, the first project he asked me to work on was the project of taking that white paper and activating it inside of the company. And I said, well, but if I do it, will you make me chief marketing officer? And he was like, absolutely not. You're a child, <laughs> right? You're a child and, and you would have to be a partner. And I was like, make me a partner. He's like, shut, shut up, just shut up. Just come in and do this project. You're lucky that you, know, you get to work at the top of the echelon of the company. Anyway, within three years, I was the youngest elected partner of the firm ever. And I was the chief marketing officer at a ridiculously stupid age. So look, this book, Leading Without Authority, isn't just for that, that young man and woman, because um, what I have learned over the years, and because that message, what I just told you, was also taught in every alone. How do you deepen relationships mm -hmm. and become so audacious to believe that anything's possible, along with deepening relationships, along with leading with generosity, because nobody's going to, what I did for Pat Laconto, the CEO, is I led with generosity, right? I did something nobody else could have imagined doing, and I went way overboard to be of service to somebody based on their vision, not my ambition, mm -hmm. right? So I did that. Then um, what's interesting is, and, and I tell this story in literally the, the first chapter of Leading Without Authority, then I get to be this big deal right? And, and there's articles written about me. And I get invited over to be the chief marketing officer and head of sales globally at Starwood Hotels. Now, this was a young brand at the time. Barry Sternlich was a young CEO, ambitious, driven. We were creating the W Hotel. We were creating the St. Regis Hotel. I was overseeing the marketing and sales of this massive global enterprise. And, and we wanted, and I created with the team, the Starwood Preferred Guest Program, which is the, it became award-winning, da 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 right? I behaved like a leader who clung to authority mm. because this was what I was suggesting. Um, I felt like, wow, I had busted my ass to, to do all of these things that, I need, that, I, that, that wasn't, weren't handed to me at Deloitte. Thank God I now have authority. Thank yeah. God I now have permission to lead. Thank, you know, and I treated the head of Europe like, like an individual that I knew better as the global head of marketing. Right, I took the budget away. I reallocated it. I wanted to make Starwood a big deal. And anyway, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, we did a lot of great things. I'm not going to suggest the tenure there wasn't 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 really glistening. It was awesome, but I made a lot of mistakes. And the biggest mistake that I made was the head of Europe became the new CEO, <laughs> and that uh, made he just viscer eviscerated the global marketing function. He basically took all global marketing and he said, "You want to be." Head of North America, I was like, yeah, okay, I, I'm gone, I get it. Um, so I see today leaders, leading organizations where they feel that they've got to have control and authority to be transformational. And I, I'm skipping to the, to the punchline here. You know, we, even in my own company, I think of a division head of a company of mine that feels that they have to have control over this person or that budget or this, that, whatever. And you know, as soon as I see that, I, re I see myself as a young 20-something, the ego associated with needing to control and to have a, you know, to, in order to be extraordinary. Mm. And, and what I realize is if you, tr if, you sh if you fight for control to be extraordinary, the fight for the control is a dissipation of the energy to be extraordinary. Yeah. Because the inputs that you need to be extraordinary are so unbounded. So my team today, so, you know, you were just talking, and I, I want to, you're, by the way, you're one of the, one of the few, but 
I love interviewing with you because you have so much to contribute. So I apologize that I'm going on so long in this discussion because it's awesome. I want to no, hear no your, your point of view. Um, but what, what's happened is to be transformational today, you've got to be unbounded on who's your team. My team today includes one of my dearest teammates is Peter Diamandis, who wrote the book Abundance. And he's got a new book out just about global transfer. I mean, the guy is one of those brilliant people in the world, but he's one of my teammates, right? He and I talk multiple times a week. Jim Quick, you know, who is, is one of the most successful businesses in online products, et cetera, and one of the most beautiful humans in the world is on my team, right? Uh, just this morning, there's a, there's a young man that, you know, used to run this key thing called the um, Speaker Actor Global Network, and I've got this book coming out, and he reaches out to me and goes, Keith, how do I activate influencers for you? And we just designed a scheme where I'm going to give um, free coaching away to a set of entrepreneurs who could drive 500 book sales in the coming week, right? Larry is on my team. And so it's like my team is unbounded, and, and I couldn't afford any of them, right? And so that's what we need in our lives today. So, you know, there's really three audiences here. There's this audience of this young person that we as entrepreneurs need to unleash, or this young person that you as an individual, forget what your company tells you. You, like back in the day when I was at Deloitte, I didn't need to be unleashed. I unleashed in service and created transformation. And then when I screwed it up at Starwood, I realized, and I see all of these executives still screwing it up today by fighting for control and authority as opposed to being unbounded. And then I look at entrepreneurs now like myself, who is taking leading without authority and creating extraordinary things in a, in a, in a time of crisis that, it, that I couldn't been able to find. I've been able to find unexpected growth opportunities that I would have never smelled, never mm -hmm. smelled if I had been constrained by the traditional boundaries of what leadership is that I used to believe in. Yeah, you know, I, I think the lesson I got from that experience that I went through was that um, there, there, are, there ultimately are two types of authority. There's the authority that's given to you and there's the authority you, look, you, you earn. You earn. And, and if, the, yeah. if you wait for the authority that's given to you, then you sit there like, please, sir, can I have some more? You're constantly waiting for this authority to be given to you. Or, Whereas or worse, if you, you're undermining. Or worse, you're undermining. That's right. And, and then there's I, that, yeah. I mean, I see people creating bad energy and undermining others subconsciously. I mean, they're, not, they're yeah. not bad people, but they think that there's a competition for, for the budget. And the reality is we need to co-create. You know, we need so to co when this, So when this situation happened for me, what was interesting is first of all, I declined the job because I thought the measurements were too difficult. Like I, if I'd had no authority to make decisions at all, then how are you, you know, the performance, but I declined the job and then did the job. So I declined the promotion, I declined the pay rise, the whole thing. But then I decided from that day on, I would just do the job. I would train the people, I'd spend the time, I'd do it anyway. And what's, you know what's crazy? I earned the authority. It, it, yeah. That's what ended up happening. And yeah. what's Everybody crazy is you can't it. earn authority by tearing other people down. You only, you know, so that's why I was so fascinated to hear you speaking about that at that last, um, uh, uh, you, you were on metal yesterday. And, yeah. uh, and boy, like you just, there's some, really powerful insights about the personal responsibility of leadership that's so much better than waiting for somebody to give it to you. You know, you said something, and I, I often have this conversation with young people in the company um, where they want, they, it's not, this isn't about young people, it's just about people. They want the job before they start doing the job. Mm. And I'm like, no, that is totally the wrong way to think about it. You start doing the job so far before you ever ask for it, that it's, that it's not even a question when you ask for it. Now, I do have to say that there's plenty of leaders out there who don't recognize um, and don't pay for value. So they have people doing the job and then that person comes to them and says, well, listen, you know, can I have the pay raise, can I, et cetera. And the, the archaic nature of somebody's thinking doesn't give somebody that leap forward because they're still thinking about that person as this age, in this role, despite yeah. the fact that they're actually providing a lot of value. I've made that mistake. I've made that mistake in the past, not giving people the credit for the value they were creating because my mind was stuck who in who I thought they were. Yeah. And yet, once I, once I lost them, I realized how ridiculous I was for not having valued them on what they were contributing at the time. I don't know, you're probably better. Look, I, what you're basically hearing from me is I've made a lot of mistakes as an entrepreneur. And, and, I, and all of my books are written 
from having failed to do them at some point in my life to then suffer the failure. And then I write about the way it should be. So that's basically my, you know, Keith, I don't think, I, I don't think there's another way. Like, you know, it's funny. People always ask me like, what, how do you choose a good business consultant? I'm like, well, you know, you want to make sure they're a good communicator, that they've really been successful in their lives and that they've at least had one bankruptcy. Because <laughs> like, if they haven't had some terrible stuff, then what kind of coach or mentor or consultant are they going to be when the terrible stuff happens? So yeah. I, I think the best lessons do come from that, which by the way, that is part of the whole leadership thing is, is uh, uh, at least for me, it's like not trying to, not pretending you're perfect, right? You know, it's like, being here. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, just to talk about bankruptcy, I, I've never talked about this on uh, out in the open, but I've had two businesses in my life that failed miserably to the point where bankruptcy should have been the option. One of them was when I just got out of Yale. I had moved to Wilmington, Delaware with nothing but debt, but a reasonable credit rating. And I had met somebody who suggested that the real estate uh, uh, industry was a good industry to get into. So, but for some reason he didn't have a good credit rating. So he said, all I needed to do was volunteer my credit rating. Um, and I just saw money because I had never had money in my life. You know, I had been the poor kid working in the dining halls at Yale, double shifts just to be able to afford it, you know, et cetera, right? So I was all glimmered. And um, not only did I give my credit rating, but I was so excited about it that I went back and raised money from people where I came from. And 5,000 bucks where I came from was a lot of money. And, and I raised a bunch of money. Um, and, and then that was in 1988 to 90. So I don't know if anybody remembers that period of time, but the real estate industry didn't do so well back then. And here I was faced with potential bankruptcy. And, um, and I saw, no, oh God, I remember the tears, the angst, the anxiety. I didn't go there. I didn't go to bankrupt. Um, I, I renegotiated with every person I had raised money from that if they hold off and let me go to business school. When I get out of business school, I'd get a good job and I'd start paying them back. And uh, that's what I did um, uh, at that point in time. Um, I did something similar to happen later in life and I had a bunch of investors. And it's interesting because I didn't end up um, bankrupting the company. I, I ended up selling it so that my employees got to move to another place. But uh, what I did was I've kept a list of everybody who invested and I'm making sure that I go through every single name in my life and commensurate to what value they entered into the company. I'm trying to give them some value back. They don't even know it, but they, I've never said anything about this, but I'm going through it every single name. I think that makes me a pretty shitty entrepreneur um, because it's, I know it's a, so many folks that have, you know, gone in and out of businesses and everyone's like, Hey, listen, you know, they're, they're they're 25,000 bucks, they're 200,000 bucks, they're 500, they knew what they were getting into, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't know, I've just never had that heart to be able, because when I raise money from somebody, I'm looking at somebody and I know they're investing in me. Mm. And I don't know, I mean, this is, this is something, I'm gonna have an interview with a psychologist right when we're done with this, I'll, I'll, I'll lie on the couch and go there for this one. You know, I, Keith, I would suggest to you that there's no right or wrong with that sort of thing. Um, what I mean is, is that the bankruptcy laws are there. You know, we, we, most of us live in countries that have those and they're there to protect us and allow us to take some risks and, and allow us to not destroy our lives if those things happen. And, um, and unfortunately, in most places, the laws are kind of set up like if you, if you let's say you raise some money from this friend, but you also yeah. owed Visa some money. If you pay back the friend, you also have to pay back Visa and Visa... Yeah charged you interest, like in order to justify losing money. And so I think it's, it, I like the way you're talking about it. It's that, okay, maybe I'm not keeping an active credit role here, but I'm, I'm going back and serving those people. And, I, and, right. and that, that's part of, I think what you said earlier really is about your um, unbounded teammates. Like you're absolutely, I'm with you completely. I was just funny. You mentioned Jim Crick. I was just talking to him yesterday and it's like, what, what's really fascinating is recognizing the value of that social credit that you build through great personal leadership over the years. And I, so I, I, I think, yes, there are some people who would say you're not a good entrepreneur if you're not taking advantage of your rights under bankruptcy. But I would say on the other side, maybe you're just really caring a lot about your network. Yeah, and I have. And look, yeah. and, and to me, my network, that word was something that I fought when I wrote the book Never Eat Alone. It was interesting. Um, of course, Never Eat Alone is a book about network. But back then, I mean, and I, and I have to say that I'm so, I'm so honored to have made an impact globally on the redefinition of that word. Um, that book has had resonance. I'll, I'll be working out in Vietnam and some young 
girl will come up to me and she'll run back into her office at the gym because she's the gym manager and she'll bring up a tattered copy of Never Eat Alone in Vietnamese and, and said that she read it in her village and it gave her the path to be able to get into Ho Chi Minh and reinvent her life. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, just mm -hmm. it, it, to me, um, to me, that book is a drop the mic. There's a few things I've done that I can really say that it's time to, if I die, I'm good, right? And that's one of them. Um, and reinventing the word networking to realize that it's not about networking. It's because that does, that sounds too transactional. Yeah, it's about, very much. It's about authentic relationships that co-create together. And so what I've done is you move forward. I actually think this new book could be a drop the mic book. Um, I really do. And it's, it's a book and I created a new word for how I want people to live. It's a, it's a value set in business. And the word is, I want us all to live in co-elevation. Mm. Co-elevation. Um, and I believe it will reinvent the word collaboration because in the word collaboration, it's about <clears throat> interacting with each other to achieving a new outcome, right? But in the word co-elevation, it's about going higher together. Yeah. It's about collaboration, but co-development as well, where people are elevating both as individuals. It's a commitment to a mission, but it's a commitment to each other. So I don't know if Eric, if you know what I do for a living, but for a living, at least traditionally what I've done for a living, uh, things are changing right now in the midst, but traditionally what I've done for a living is I coach executive teams. So I go into an organization and my job is to get that team to co-elevate. And through the co-elevation, I coach them to become uh, radically adaptable. We adopt an agile process. We redefine the strategy of the business and we sprint to transformational outcomes. I take everything I've learned from Peter Diamandis in exponential organizations and I adapt and I coach it with my philosophy. We have eight attributes of high performing teams, right? That I coach to. So that's what I do. I create this co-elevation mindset to achieve, you know, extraordinary outcomes in, and, and, and radical adaptability. The big thing is the shift from what a team used to think of itself as, which is hub and spoke to a leader, where the leader sits at the middle of the team and decisions and arbitration and motivation, where we as leaders are running around playing um, whack-a-mole with all the things we have to do as opposed to a leader who recognizes that their job is to coach the team to coach the team, to shift accountability from the leader to the team, to the team to the team, to shift encouragement and energy building from the leader to the team on the team. So what we do is we have these, we have these diagnostics where we, we identify the eight attributes of a high-performing team, but all of them are owned by the team, not the leader. Mm. So that's radical shift to co-creation, co-development. And we even, we even agree that if we all have to grow by 30%, both hard and soft skills, to meet the demands of the business, we own each other's growth. So Ray Dalio wrote this book about principles where he talks mm -hmm. about radical transparency and feedback but I joke with Ray, he hires assholes. It's easy <laughs> when, when you hire resilient people who don't mind competing and, and arguing with each other. But the rest of us hire sensitive, insecure people like me. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so when you're hiring sensitive, insecure people who are triggered, and then you need to create psychological safety underneath the candor, but the team's got to care about each other. So that's one of the, the eight attributes. And one of the eight attributes is relationship. You've got to build relationship to have permission to sell, tell somebody they have their head up their ass, right? So it's like, that is because I, because I care about your success, because I care about you, because you're so important to our success, I need to share this, mm. right? That's, that's an essence of feedback. These are all new. And so anyway, just to, to end with, I'm trying to recontract business. And I was so blessed. This is the other drop, drop the mic moment. The um, uh, Mark, Mike, uh, Mark Royce, who's the president of General Motors, worked right underneath Mary Barra. So basically, it was Gerald who runs uh, engineering and, 
and Mark that runs everything else other than engineering. Um, he, you know, he, he said to the General Motors organization, co-elevation is, is going to be our pathway through this. Um, and it was the exact same thing. They brought us back in because we were there when they came out of bankruptcy. And that's what helped them. The CFO of GM said that this is what helped them not go back into bankruptcy. So we're, we're doing this with the World Bank. We're doing it with Delta Airlines. And I want the world to adopt co-elevation as a principle, even of our marriages for that matter. I mean, it's I, funny I, you say that. I, I, I have a question for you about co-elevation um, because, I, okay, I saw this interesting little meme on Instagram the other day, but it basically said, um, it basically said something along the lines of, uh, it is possible that occasionally uh, the healing of our own, own emotional wounds then um, exposes the emotional wounds of the people around us to even brighter light. You know, whether it's our parents or our spouse or our coworkers or what have you. In other words, there are some people who you can, you can be completely into co-elevation, but as you elevate yourself, they become jealous of your elevation. And so how, talk to me, how would you cope with that? It, even in the construct of a marriage or in running in a business, like you're all trying to co-elevate and one person isn't up to speed. Yeah. And, and now they're, you know, they're now potentially kind of, I don't know how to put it, but there's a resentment there. How, how do you, how do you, how do you so, clean that in the organization? Yeah. Um, the, the, for me, there's a chapter in the book. I'm just looking up the chapter, chapter two, and it's called, it's all on you. It's all on you. And I learned this from my son. Um, I have two boys. One's now 21 and one's 25. Uh, got them at 12 and 16. And the boys were foster children um, when they came into our home. And <clears throat> the younger one was always so angry crazy angry. I mean, and violent at times. Um, there were times we would go to bed and, and wonder whether or not we would be, we would actually someday die at his hands. There was, there was a 50-50 shot, we thought. Um, and at no point, because of my commitment to that boy, my own integrity, my commitment to my faith, um, at no point could I cross my arms and say, when you behave like my son, I will be your father. Mm. I didn't have that option. That's right. Because this was important. Now in business, I see people who are taking a very big paycheck and have fiduciary responsibility to shareholders. You can, you can see a theme for me when I believe that people who invest their money in businesses deserve something back and they deserve a certain set of in behaviors that are of a certain integrity. Um, and I, and I want to make sure that the integrity of professionalism shifts. And I believe co-elevation, which is the belief that an executive owes everything to get the job done that they possibly can. So what instead happens is you sit there and you cross your arms and you're like, well, that jackass head of sales, I can't work that person. That person doesn't have... Um, integrity themselves that person makes things difficult they're you know blah blah blah. all of these excuses and this person sits there and relinquishes their responsibility for continuing to create value because the partner that they believe they should be partnering with isn't behaving the way they want them to behave no you, you got to go down deeper than that you mm. you laziness is not an excuse for not upholding your responsibility because it is lazy or indulgence, frankly, I, I've seen people who have, have gotten to the point where I've seen massive shareholder value, massive shareholder value eroded in major companies. We're talking billions and billions of dollars eroded because two executives don't like each other. Mm -hmm. Truly, that to me is unfathomable, but it exists. And, and my view is I bring this shit out right in the open. My job as a team coach is I literally say this stuff in a team meeting once I have earned the permission to the team, I say this stuff. So there, you know, it's interesting. There's a, there, there's a huge industry around executive coaching. But that to me is like having, being a therapist, lying somebody on the couch and talking about their marriage when the reality is you need to get the spouse in there and you need to talk this out between the two of them, right? I mean, I, I'm not suggesting I, I disagree with executive coaching or therapy. I've had plenty of it. But couples counseling is critical in in shifting the behavior of a couple. Team coaching is critical in shifting the behavior of a team. 
And, and, I, and what, I, what you need to do, and I've created a, a website on this. It's called virtualteamswin.com. I believe that right now in this, in this environment today, in this environment today, um, entrepreneurs need to be rebooting the social contract of their team and living up to what we've been talking about for a lot of time around the future of work. It's upon us living up to these behaviors of co-elevation, leading without authority and, and recontracting who we are together in a team. And I, and I put on virtualteamswin.com, I put a, a, a recontracting um, script for a leader to begin to look at. It's very similar to the diagnostic tool that I would charge for in my work. It's a recontracting script that a leader can say, here are the eight attributes of a team that, that and, and for instance, on, on candor, can we challenge each other openly in the room? That's a, good, that's a, that's a high integrity question. Are we allowed yeah. to challenge each other openly in the room? Because if we can't, then we're not being a high integrity team. So anyway, there's eight of them. And I feel that this recontracting, I think that right now in a remote environment, like you've done in rebooting your business on a virtual basis, there is, there's an opportunity for all of us to reboot our business in a remote environment that will actually make us better than we ever were in a co-located co environment. And I try to give you the tools on virtualteamswin.com on that and in the book, Leading Without Authority. Keith, that sounds really good. And I think it's, it, 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 I, I've heard so many people talking about, wow, I tried working remote before, but it really didn't work. And all of a sudden now I can make it work. Well, it's because you have no choice. You know, no it's choice. suddenly you're being forced into it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not one for massive uh, use of profanity online, but I'm going to say this, is that I believe that really good friends, really good senior managers, really good married couples should all be entering a pack that I affectionately refer to the asshole prevention program. And, you know, that's, that's basically where, you know, like a husband and wife need to be able to communicate with the other and go, honey, we don't talk to people like that. Like, <laughs> it's like, you know, every now and again, one of us steps over the bounds and the other one needs to be able to do like you're saying that, like, uh, no, 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 we don't, we don't do that. And I see a lot of times, um, frankly, people don't want that kind of direct feedback. And it's like the minute they, they, if they so, so that, that kind of leads me to a question. And it's, can, can, can I tell you about that? Yeah, but let me frame it here the way I, you know, yep. you mentioned the thing about Ray, like he's hiring tough, robust people that are, they take the feedback right on the nose, but then there's people like you, and I would say I'm, I'm probably in that camp as well, a little bit more sensitive. So how do we cultivate that? How yep. do we create that yeah, environment yeah. where we can give that feedback? Yeah, so that's in, that's in chapter six. And the answer is, what, so, so I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been recontracting with teams how they interact. Right? I've been doing this for 20 years. And this is my first leadership book. I've never, I've never gone out and codified what I've been doing as a coach. I've never codified it in this way. And the reason I've done this now is for a couple of reasons. On a personal basis, I want to make a bigger impact. And I feel that if I can, the more I codify what I do, the more other people can do it without me being there. You know, so we've just opened a middle market business that I've been hiring coaches who now go out and for a significantly lower price point, we've been building info products. On this one particular point, I will double click on it for you. And it's beautiful, I really like it. In the olden days, feedback happened only by our managers. When you got feedback in the workplace, you got it from your managers. You didn't get feedback from a peer. Rarely, rarely would a peer give you feedback. That was not a part of the contract. Mm. The social contract, is you looked up for your feedback, okay? And I mean, look at it. think about how many times feedback peer to peer went through the manager. It was an individual frustrated with you went to their manager who went to your manager and then it came back down to you, right? That, and by the way, by the time all that happened, the feedback had gotten so contorted and the empathy was missing, right? And it was really more about compliance. You know, it was what you're doing wrong. And, and then there was a fight. And then most likely when it went over and up and down, the, this, this line of management probably agreed with each other to some extent how you were behaving and there was no empathy for where this line of management agreed with the behavior. So it was just a mess. It was a mess. When you make a commitment to go peer to peer on the feedback, the first thing you do is you actually have to make the verbal commitment. 
So you and your wife have a verbal commitment because you're an enlightened couple that you want to elevate each other, that you give each other feedback. I mean, that's an important part of the awareness, which is the commitment is there. And, and listen, I'm not sure all marriages have that. I, I think everybody critiques each other in marriage, but I'm not sure you have the permission. Mm. Right? So there's a distinction there. There's a codified distinction as to what is our role in relationship with each other. And the reason why th- I'm so er- glad Eric you asked this question, this was the essence for why I wrote Leading Without Authority. I started writing Leading Without Authority eight years ago. And the original idea of the book was, I think within, because I was Mr. Relationship, never read alone, who's got your back. And what I believed was that within every relationship, there was a tacit contract to give each other coaching and feedback. So I wanted to write the book that would teach you how to be the best coach to everybody around you. That's what the original idea of the book. But then, and I can explain why it ended up where it ended up, but I realized I I don't want to just write a book about the tacit permission to coach your peers. I wanted to write a book on how you achieve greatness and transformation. And a critical element of that was the tacit permission to coach peers. So leading without authority, you can see where it would be important to say, how do I coach an individual? If I'm leading without authority over you, how do I coach you? How do I give you feedback? So the biggest thing is the awakening that the whole contract changes. You used to have permission based on your position. You used to have permission based on your position to give feedback. Mm-hmm. When, that, when you take away positional authority as permission, what do you have to do? You have to earn permission to coach. You have to earn permission to coach. And change the culture. Well, I'm just talking about between the two of us. Got yeah, yeah, yeah. If I want to give you feedback, right? And you happen to be a sensitive individual. How do I give you feedback? I need to earn permission to coach. So there's an entire chapter on earning permission to coach. And the, the chapter is, is serve, share, and care. And I, you can imagine what that means. Mm-hmm. You've, got to, you've got to invest significantly in building your psychological safety through generosity, through vulnerability, through intimacy, through showing care and concern. I've got to, I've got to overdo, right? What I would have normally needed to do I've got to overdo to make you psychologically safe. I own your psychological safety, right? Now, if you have a hair trigger um, uh, sensitivity and you're, you're not naturally psychologically safe, then I've got to work harder, right? Go back to the chapter of it's all on you. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean you give up the, the need to do it. If, that, if giving that person feedback and changing that person's behavior is important to you achieving your outcomes, then you need to work harder to build their psychological safety if they don't naturally have it, right? So you know, sure and Keith, I, I'm and, sure you've heard the, uh, I'm sure you've heard the example. I can't remember what book is in for economics or something, but uh, this concept of, um, you know, leading without authority, for me, one of the great stories of that is that, you know, the, when they discovered the anomaly of, uh, there, there was, uh, you know, the Korean air crashes that m- the vast majority of the Korean air mm. crashes were when the, when the oh, uh, pilot. pilot was at the wheel. And it was like, why would, why would that happen? And it's because the co-pilot in South Korean culture didn't feel that they could, yeah, it was too different and differential. And, and they had to do this whole, like get permission from the captain. So the co-pilot knows they can give them the right. feedback. And, and so not only, I think we have to look at peer to peer, but we have to look uh, maybe even absolutely different. well and the other way and that's i i ignore positional authority in the entire book i don't care gotcha. if you work for somebody if you're a peer of the individual or subordinate it's all leading without authority and part of it is because in this day and age a lot of the young people that work for you they give you no authority anyway you still gotta earn it and and by the way and i think that's perfectly acceptable yeah i think it raises the hurdle because every one of these individuals could leave you tomorrow and go get another job or if the, the exceptional one certainly could. So you've got to lead without authority, even if you have it, right? And that's the other point of this book. Let me finish just this little piece about the feedback because it's kind of an interesting jujitsu move. Um, I was once coaching a team and this one gentleman, he was Irish and he said, oh, well, in my culture, I'm just candid and we're always candid and I feel per- perfectly comfortable being candid. I'm like, well, great, we're going to get along well. And then I watched him in the meeting and I said, sir, I you know, I appreciate what you said, but what you're really being is a lazy asshole. You're not, I mean, what you're doing is you're just throwing candor out on the table like a turd and you don't give a damn 
whether anybody hears it or does anything with it. It's indulgent. You're just throwing out truth bombs recklessly. If you want to be a member of this team, you have to own how your feedback lands and you've got to give, you've got to work your ass off to give it the highest likelihood of it getting executed. Now you're a professional, right? So this, this is the difference when you give feedback in a world where maybe I could have just cut to the chase. I, I took too long. Sorry about that. But I wanted to give you the sort of the etymology of how we come to this, but in a world where you want to lead in abundance with extraordinary people who don't have to listen to you. You own how the feedback lands and it's your responsibility to get it executed. Now, a lot of people will just throw out their hands and say, Keith, you don't understand what a jackass have to deal with. And I'm like, I do. I've worked with plenty of them and I have been them. So I get it. Um, so the key is though, you've got to own it. You got to own it the whole way through and it takes more work. And that's why I have this chapter in the book uh, that talks about the, the six deadly excuses, right? And one of them is indulgence and one of them is laziness. And there's all of these excuses we have in our head as to why other people make it difficult for us to get the job done. And I just shoot everyone down one by one until you start to realize it's all on you, which is the, the chapter of the title, title of the chapter.